Thomas Kenneth Mattingly, better known as TK, has been instrumental in the development of the United States Space Program, and his journey began right here on the Plains of Auburn. One thing I would say about Ken Mattingly is that Ken Mattingly has the real right stuff. The real right stuff is, a, is someone who is in an airplane or the cockpit of a spacecraft and who is totally dependable, uh, who is uh, highly thoughtful, very innovative technically, uh, very, very solid um, uh, in, in terms of the skills they bring to bear. Mattingly's role in NASA's Apollo 13 mission was made well known by the film Apollo 13, in which actor Gary Sinise portrayed Mattingly, who was originally designated to be the command module pilot for the mission, but was grounded due to medical precautions for a condition that never developed. Hello there, Deke. What's the story? Jim, we're going to get that power-up procedure to you. We're going to get it as soon as we possibly can. Ken Mattingly's in the simulator right now. Ken's working on it. From Mission Control, TK played an instrumental role in helping the astronauts of Apollo 13 return safely home. We know they have some power left in the LEM batteries, right? Yeah. We have an umbilical that provides power from the command module to the LEM. All right, it's backup for the LEM power supply. I'm listening. So, reverse it. Reverse the flow and see if we can draw these four amps from the LEM batteries before we cut it loose. Why can't we do that? We don't have a procedure for that, do we? You're going to lose a lot in the transfer, Ken. Yeah, yeah, but all we're talking about here is four amps. He told me that he said, you know, there were thousands of people rolled into that character. And I know that there were thousands of people that worked to bring that crew home, but I know that TK played an integral role in making that happen. Mattingly's involvement with the Apollo program began long before Apollo 13. His roles included aiding in the development of the Apollo spacesuits, planning of the Apollo 8 flight to the moon, and helping to organize Apollo 11, which led to the program's first lunar landing. Mattingly would later go on to successfully pilot the command module for Apollo 16. He's only one of 12 men to have gone to the moon and orbited that moon. Um, and that's undoubtedly one of the highlights of his career. Mattingly attended Auburn University on a Navy ROTC scholarship and earned a degree in aeronautical engineering in 1958. Two years later, in 1960, Mattingly earned his wings and would go on to amass 5,000 hours of jet aircraft experience, flying the A-1H aircraft and the A-3B aircraft from aircraft carriers. From there, he set his sights on the stars. In 1966, Mattingly was honored as a distinguished graduate from the U.S. Air Force Aerospace Research Pilot School and selected as one of NASA's Original 19, a select group of pilots who would go on to either fly to the moon or fly shuttle missions. Mattingly accomplished both. One thing about Ken is you don't want to just call him a, a spaceman or an astronaut. I mean, he is a very solid engineer. He's a naval aviator. He became a rear admiral in the United States Navy, after all. And he became a very accomplished and respected aerospace executive. So you put all of that together, and the man's just had an unbelievably extraordinary life and, and life's work. Mattingly's career with NASA continued well beyond the Apollo program, as he served as head of astronaut support in the Shuttle Transportation System program. He led the Astronaut Office Ascent Entry Group, and he was technical assistant for flight tests of the Orbital Flight Test Program. After serving as backup commander for STS-2 and STS-3, Mattingly was appointed commander for the Space Shuttle Columbia's fourth and final test. This was the famous Auburn flight because it was a flight that Ken commanded, but his pilot for that flight was Hank Hartsfield who's also an Auburn graduate. And one other thing about Apollo 16, which tells you about Ken and his fondness for Auburn University, um, Ken apparently brought an Auburn flag with him on that mission. The astronauts were not allowed to, make, to take many personal items with them. And I think that says a lot about how, what Ken, how fondly Ken kept Auburn University in his heart. Since Mattingly's retirement, He's returned to Auburn on a number of occasions to speak with students of the College of Engineering. I think that he really has had an impact on students and he has a love for students. And um, the engineering students really ask a lot of questions of him and, and 
he loves to take the time to teach them and to impart his knowledge upon them. And I think that that's one lasting contribution that he's made to Auburn. Ken, I believe, comparable to Neil Armstrong, would pro probably say that first and foremost, of all the things he is, he's, in, in a professional sense, that he's an engineer. And he became an engineer at Auburn University. In terms of what Ken means to Auburn, I mean, certainly we have unbelievable respect and admiration for his life and his career. He really has uh, a name recognition that would, uh, and has more or less done the heroic exploits that really appeal uh, to the American public. And, you know, for a dean of a college of engineering to have a grad like that, it can't get much more gratifying. Following his retirement from the Navy as a Rear Admiral in 1989, Manningly continued his involvement with aerospace engineering within the commercial business environment. Mattingly took on such projects as developing commercial uses for General Dynamics' Atlas launch vehicle. He headed up the X-33 development program for Lockheed Martin, as well as becoming director of Grumman Space Station Support Group. And he has served as president of the Rocket Development Company, which is dedicated to developing low-cost commercial launch systems. He had real high management positions with real technical problems and issues to solve. Um, he would not have taken jobs if they just wanted him to be the token astronaut on the board. I think his greatest accomplishments have been the continued uh, promotion of the importance of America's efforts in space. The technology that has come from uh, that effort that has uh, you know, basically enhanced and changed life in probably every household in America. Mattingly has been decorated with numerous awards throughout his stellar career, including the Johnson Space Center Group Achievement Award and the American Astronautical Society Flight Achievement Award. NASA has also awarded Mattingly with the Ambassador of Exploration Award, a lunar sample collected during the Apollo space explorations which Mattingly so passionately dedicated his life to seeing through. Uh, he selected the College of Engineering at Auburn University to display his award. It tells you something about TK's loyalty to Auburn University. It holds a special place in his heart. And I think to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award, which is the, um, the highest award you can receive at Auburn, means the world to him. This is a different one. This is a family award. This is a recognition from your family that you have accomplished great things. For a man with such a distinguished career of excellence, amongst his defining characteristics, TK is an extremely modest and very reserved individual. It is this down-to-earth quality that others find so remarkable when they recall conversations with him. I've never met Thomas. Thomas is, a, is TK's son. But I can tell you how proud TK is of Thomas. Um, when we talk about Thomas, his, he just beams. He does love uh, orange sports cars. One of the things I remember him telling me was that he had told Thomas when he, when he finished his degree, when he um, became a doctor, that he owed TK a, a sports car. So I don't know if he ever got the sports car, but, um, but I do know that TK is so proud of his son. I don't think anybody ever questioned the dependability of, of Ken Mattingly. He's a very disciplined man, very, very strong work ethic, very driven. Some people, you know, that, that they're driven by a passion for something. And I think that he's driven by passion for a successful space program. For a man who has reached into the heavens, his feet have always been planted firmly on the ground. From the humble plains of Auburn to lunar orbit, T.K. Mattingly has been an outstanding achiever. Ladies and gentlemen, we're so incredibly honored that he is an Auburn University graduate, and we, we believe in our hearts that his, his story is something that will stay with us forever and will be a motivation and, and uh, 
and, and a factor of, of stimulating young people to dream big and to never give up. Failure is not an option. Uh, those are all uh, elements of who Ken Mattingly is. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, an Auburn man, an Auburn engineer, an American astronaut, an American hero, Ken Mattingly. I know where to stop, start. And I know that someone's counting the clock on me. It's time to stop. But there's a couple of things that you need to know. And I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to share with you some of my observations, which uh, may not always reflect what you just saw. <laughs> Actually, my name's Gary Sisanese. <laughs> You know, you owe a lot to a lot of people. There's no way you can ever enumerate them all. There's no way you can thank them all. Uh, I do want to pay particular thanks in public uh, to a couple of family people that have put up with my quirks and, and intensity and uh, helped me uh, get along. Uh, Kathleen is not able to be here tonight, and it's unfortunate, but uh, she has really put up with me. And, uh, and my son, uh, Thomas is probably, I'm going to embarrass him, he's become one of my best friends. And I can say nothing more than thanks for giving me that opportunity. Now there's some other people, and I wanted to share with you just very quickly an idea when we ask ourselves what, what, what goes on. There was a, a fundraising campaign here uh, a couple of years ago, and its theme was something like, and it all began at Auburn. Let me just put a couple extra tickets with that. When I look back and say, well, what happened and what, what impressed me, just off the top of my head, what were the things I remember? Starting, I do remember Dr. Foy. I have great fond memories of Bill Ham, who used to run the laundry and cleaners. <laughs> that man represents all. I have fond memories of Professor Fred Martin. Some of you here may remember Fred. He came to Auburn the same year I got into aeronautical engineering. He taught me two lessons that were very, very painful and very useful. He told me what accountability meant. And what it meant in my case was it was three o'clock on the morning of graduation ceremony before I was allowed to graduate. <laughs> Seems I had more fun at Chewbacca than I did in the lab. <laughs> there was no way I was going to graduate until I was turned in. And I hit him on the door at three in the morning. <laughs> he also taught me something that was terribly important. Stop whining about what you would like to have and don't. Make it happen with what you've got. And he helped us build stuff for our laboratories. And the lessons that we learned there have stayed with us ever since. So that's a hell of a good start. <laughs> There's other people that came right behind and took the spots. I owe Jack Helmick a special thanks. He graduated in NRTC a year before me. What was his contribution that made made a difference for me. He arranged for me to go watch a Titan II launch while we were both stationed at Navy Jacks. And up until that time, I thought spacecraft were ugly. Airplanes were pretty. I went down there and watched this Titan take off and watched two brand new F-4s 
get lost behind and I say, you know, there's something to this business. <laughs> that looks like fun. <laughs> and from there, the, the snowball goes on. There was a, a simulator instructor that I got into at Dan Bland at the Cape who tried his best to teach me how to stay alive, and I tried my best to defeat him. <laughs> he won, fortunately. There's a couple of people in this community that come back into my story over and over again. Hank Hartsfield's one of those. Hank's here, and I didn't know he was going to be, but I got it. this was my plan all along. Made him at ARPS, the Air, Air Force Test Pilot School, and he was an instructor. And we both had interest in space. He went to the Air Force Man Orbiting Laboratory Program, and I went to NASA. Uh, actually, I had wanted to go to Amboel, and I thought I would have a better chance there. <laughs> Through a bunch of bizarre circumstances, <coughs> Hank came to NASA when MOL was canceled and became the key to our Apollo 16 flight where we kept trying to do more and more things and there wasn't room. And Hank says, why don't you let me run the flight plan? Because you're always watching the clock and trying to do other things. And so Hank took over and did our entire flight plan when we were in radio communications and let me look out the window and have a ball. <laughs> and we actually learned some things. It was a, a, a magic thing. I took care of me again on STS-4 after we worked so hard to, to get going together. And uh, what does a pilot do for you? Well, the week before flight, I walked over to our office door and closed it and said, can I talk to you? And I thought, oh boy, now what? Yeah, sure, Hank, what, what would you like? He says, will you please promise to wear your glasses? <laughs> he says, I've been covering up for you in all our simulations because you can't read the numbers. <laughs> so I made a good promise, <laughs> but Hank still took care of us. So it, it's a... Uh, it's been a family affair for a long time, and all of the things that Hank has done to make that happen can never be overemphasized. There's another person that I ran into multiple times. His name's Tom Burson, so you may remember Tom. He uh, was the brightest guy in our class and in our OTC. Went off to be in the nuclear submarine program, came back and the next time I knew, in Apollo, we were getting ready to carry some, some cameras that people drug up from somewhere. And you look at it and say, hmm, that looks like it flies in an airplane. It must be reconnaissance or something. So we asked for briefings on this. It walks Tom Burson, hadn't seen him in years, and he plops his camera down with a big grin. And sure enough, that's uh, where it came from. We flew a special camera in the last couple of service modules around the moon. And the neatest thing was, one of these was Tom's camera, and the neatest thing was it gave me an excuse to go outside the spacecraft where there's really no horizon, there's, there's nothing to see except this little handrail and a little silver thing. And over there is a little baby Earth and I can't see the moon. Now that's a thrill. <laughs> and it all came together because of Tom's activities. Well, one last thing I have to tell you, there is another creature that has rescued me against my very best efforts. His name's Forrest. He has saved me more times than you can imagine. I keep trying to get in trouble Actually, I succeed, and Forrest has come along. He started with us with the STS, the 51C, the DOD mission. And in addition to being the probably the most versatile and competent technical manager the Space Division ever has hoped for, 
he sets the standards for that. He's also a very political, savvy person, but uses it not for game, but as a way to get communications amongst organizations. I know you can't believe it, but NASA and the Air Force were not always good friends. <laughs> and the only way we got through that mission was this general who made it possible to pull that off. He also uh, helped me get my job at Atlas, which is one of the most rewarding things I ever did. But if it hadn't been for that investigation and your help, I never would have gotten there. This story keeps going over, and it's typical of what my impression of Auburn is. It's all those people who continually do things to take care of each other. It's professionalism, it's dedication, and that's what it's all about. It did, in fact, start right here at Auburn. The Auburn spirit is real, as has already been pointed out. We must sustain it. I know we will. It's a great thing. It's been a privilege. So let me just say one thing to you. Wait up! <laughs>